The obedience is scary, <laughs> but thank you. Fred Locoval is no stranger to the Schemmel Forum. I'm delighted to say he's been here kind enough to find time for us despite numerous commitments in many parts of the world. But as Heraclitus so mem memorably observed, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. I hope that the Schimmel Forum is not the same river, that, that it's grown from a small, quiet stream into a robust, swift-flowing river, offering a trip packed with diverse and uh, very challenging topics. And I know that Fred is not the same man, to the philosopher's wise observation. He has moved from Ithaca to Cambridge and has added to his titles and responsibilities. He has two professorships uh, at Harvard, one in the, in the history in the, in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and one in International Affairs at the Kennedy School. In the latter, he's amidst faculty and students in pursuit of enlightened public policy. Fred first came here to speak on his book, Embers of War, The Fall of an Empire and the Making of Americans in Vietnam. Only weeks before, it was uh, awarded the Pulitzer Prize. I'm proud to say that after that, he didn't take us off his to-do list. <laughs> Today, he will be musing with us on a provocative subject, Do Leaders Make History? Reflections on the American Presidency. The question of whether leaders make history is a timely, if scary, one these days as we are in the throes of a very unusual presidential election campaign, in case you haven't noticed. Uh, but I promise you that we will be swimming in deeper waters today than the campaign has offered, and so let's just dive in. Fred. Well, thank you, Sandra. It is so good to be to be back. As Sandra said, uh, uh, I have, been, I think it's my fourth time actually, and delighted to be, uh, to be with you even if I'm coming from a slightly longer distance uh, today. And um, though I won't reference the campaign, you're probably happy about that, uh, when we get time for discussion, and I do want to leave time for discussion, best part of these affairs uh, often is the chance to interact uh, with one's uh, audience. Um, if you want to connect uh, any of this to our present moment, uh, we can certainly do that. But I do want to thank uh, Sandra in particular and the team here for making this possible. I love this idea of a university for a day. I think it's a great concept and I'm happy to be part of it. How much do individuals matter in history? That's really the question that I want to pose. Is any person really all that decisive in altering world affairs? What happens? <clears throat> what, after all, changes the course of history is another way of posing the question. I want to talk about that here today. Uh, and as I said, leave time for some discussion with you, if you're interested. Um, so what I want to talk about, as we would say maybe in the professoriate, is I want to talk about causality and explanation in history. And I'm, in particular, again, I want to talk about the role of human agency. What individuals uh, mean in this context. I've been thinking about these subjects a good deal of late as I prepare to, to join that dreaded subspecies of writer called presidential historian. <laughs> and I'll say a little bit more about that perhaps later. Since the days of our early forebears, historians have grappled with these matters, with this question. Thucydides, in the history of the Pelop Peloponnesian War, provided a kind of foundation work, it seems to me, for what we might call structural history. That is a kind of history that de-emphasizes the role of individuals, focuses more on, on, on broad subterranean uh, forces. Herodotus, meanwhile, gave us some of the earliest, history, earliest histories emphasizing human agency. Or consider a somewhat more recent example, although uh, quite distant from us now, namely Edward Gibbon's 
the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, which I would submit is still very fresh, more than two centuries, about 240 or 50 years since its publication. More to the point here for us this afternoon, Gibbon, the book shows Gibbon's talent for building narrative out of human initiative and the unexpected, even while he also illustrates, Gibbon also shows um, how the empire's systemic problems, how its structural problems became steadily more desperate and a kind of inexorable, inevitable decline sets in. Uh, I've also thought a lot about the work in our, in our own age, say over the last 30, 40 years, produced especially by professional historians like myself. And I would say, uh, I would say, I would make the following generalization about that work. We talked a little bit about this, I think, at lunch today in an in a indirect way, but um, the generalization would be this, that impersonal determinants, structural forces, have been for most, if not all, of this period, say the last 30, 40 years, ascendant to the comparative neglect of individual agency by historians. So why is this? I've been thinking about this. One reason for the primac primacy of these deeper structural uh, explanations is that they offer historians broad scope for the exercise of advanced learning, which is, after all, what they have. They have PhDs. Um, gives them an opportunity for interdisciplinarity, to show their, 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 their uh, comfort with interdisciplinarity, working in different disciplines. It allows them to bring to the fore determinants that appear larger and stronger than the mere actions of individuals, which seem, by contrast, inconsequential, ephemeral, and weak. So that's one explanation. Second explanation I've been able to, or at least that I've been uh, musing about, is that this approach, again, one that de-emphasizes the role of individual leaders or individual human beings, is that it responds to the understandable, though I would say unfounded, expectation that profound developments must result of profound causes. Profound, um, uh, <coughs> profound developments must result from profound causes. So World War I, for example, that great colossal catastrophe of the last century must have had grander causes than the inadequacy of individual leaders who were merely sleepwalking, to use the title of, a, of an important reason book, uh, individual leaders sleepwalking into the abyss, or for that matter, doing so fully conscious and self-aware. We feel the need, I think, as historians, and perhaps as, as human beings, to look for the explanation in deeper forces in the working out of some complex historical dialectic rather, rather than in the myopia and lack of imagination of European leaders and their subordinates. And it's true, I do want to emphasize this point up front, <clears throat> it's true, structural analysis is imperative to an understanding of the human past. Human agency, in other words, is qualified by the conditions in which individuals find themselves when making decisions. As Karl Marx famously put it, men, and I quote, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. It's a remarkable sentence. Marx here manages to capture not only the agency of human action, but he reminds us that even the most powerful individuals are constricted by time and space, by history and conditions. Herbert Spencer put it this way in 1896. This is a little less elegant, but it makes the same basic point. He said, you must admit that the genesis of a great man depends on the long series of complex influences which has produced the race in which he appears, and the social state into which the, that race has slowly grown. Before he can remake his society, his society must make him. That's Herbert Spencer, 1896. Lots of examples that we could give. 
And I'll just give you perhaps a couple here. Winston Churchill. Let's talk about Churchill for a minute. <clears throat> we can take for granted, I think, in this room that Churchill's leadership mattered a great deal in World War II. Churchill united and galvanized the British nation, bringing, for example, politicians from rival parties into his war cabinet. He claimed broad executive powers. He forged an effective working relationship with his Grand Alliance partners, Franklin Roosevelt and Joseph, Joseph Stalin. And Churchill used, to great effect, his extraordinary talents as a wordsmith and orator. More than one commentator has, noticed, has noted that Churchill mobilized the English language and took it into battle. <laughs> Yet, and you knew this was coming, for all of the powers he assumed and for all of his pugnacious charisma, Churchill could not prevent the Nazi juggernaut from rolling across the continent or later keep the Red Army from con <coughs> excuse me, conquering Eastern Europe. He could not stop Japan from seizing much of the British Empire in the Far East, but needed the Americans to take charge of the struggle there. As much as he tried, as much as he tried, Churchill could not forestall the demise of the empire as a whole, or halt the relative decline of his nation's global geopolitical power. In other words, Winston Churchill one of the great leaders, certainly, of his century, could not change the flow of history. <clears throat> he had to fashion his policies within the constraints he inherited, just as Marx understood. Or, very quickly, take another uh, topic of which I have spent a good deal of my time as a scholar uh, studying, namely the Cold War. Any satisfactory explanation of the superpower confrontation has to consider the structural forces in play. Following World War II, the great powers were left in ruins, the United States uh, accepted. And the collapse of Germany and Japan caused a power vacuum into which the two remaining major powers, the US and the Soviet Union, uh, were drawn. The gradual disintegration of empires also mattered, <coughs> as did the different economic and strategic needs and different ideologies of these two powers. Even before the defeat of the Axis powers, perceptive analysts anticipated that Washington and Moscow would seek to fill this post-war vacuum, that discord would result. The two countries, after all, had a history of discord and um, tension. Both were militarily powerful. Most of all, they were divided by sharply differing political economies with di widely divergent needs and by a deep ideological schism. Some kind of confrontation was bound to occur. But did it have to mean Cold War? That's the question. I'm not so sure. And we certainly can't answer that question by looking merely at these deeper impersonal forces. Individual leaders mattered, I submit to you. Starting with Stalin on the Soviet side and Truman on the American side. Stalin, so crucial, and this is an interesting subject, uh, but best left for another day. So crucial in mid-1941 for his decision to stand and fight after his initial panic. Uh, he initially um, uh, panicked uh, when, the, when the Nazi invasion began, but he stood and, and decided to fight. So important also for holding the whole rambling Soviet war effort together in the months that followed that, so, that German invasion, for holding his nerve in October 1941 when the whole thing seemed about to collapse, and also for sensing his limitations and allowing Zhukov and Vasilyevsky and others to do what they needed to do to hold the Germans off. Stalin, so important, that is to say, in World War II, 
and I think his, his role in the outcome of World War II has probably been un underappreciated, actually, at least in this country. Stalin also mattered in creating the Soviet-American confrontation after 1945. And Truman also matters. And we can talk about that. Now, if we fast forward to the end of the Cold War, we find again that particular individuals were important, especially Mikhail Gorbachev. Through a series of unexpected overtures and decisions, Gorbachev fundamentally transformed the nature of the superpower relationship in a way that could scarcely have been anticipated even a few years before. U.S. President Ronald Reagan, Reagan's role was, I think, less central, but still important. Not so much because of the hardline policies of his first term, 81 to 85, but because of his later willingness to enter into serious negotiations with Gorbachev uh, more as a partner than as an adversary. Reagan, I think, came to understand that ne negotiations, by the way, something that our current politicians could maybe learn, negotiations involve mutual concessions. You're not going to get everything you want in these negotiations. Uh, you will give some and you'll get some. I think Reagan came to understand this. George H.W. Bush, Bush the Elder, uh, followed this general approach. So here's the point that I want to make in this first part of the talk. Too often, structural explanations, soaring high above the everyday give and take of human interaction, too often they tend toward a deterministic view of historical development, which gives the impression that what happened had to happen. The French philosopher Henri Bergson has a I think a really nice description. He calls it the illusions of retrospective determinism. The illusions of retrospective determinism. The result, I think, is to conceal the fluidity of past situations, to blot out the effects of contingencies, and to absolve individual human beings of personal responsibility. They are, after all, according to this view, mere captives of forces they cannot control. By the way, in our present day, it can foster a disinclination, therefore, to challenge the status quo. What's the point of working to bring about change in society if everything significant that occurs is bound to happen anyway? Now, the social psychologist Philip Tetlock and the historian Jeffrey Parker, military historian, have written perceptively about this retrospective determinism and the problem that results from it. And I want to just quote what they say. Few predicted World War I, the rise of the East Asian Tigers, or the collapse, <coughs> the collapse of the Soviet Union. But virtually everyone today who claims professional competence in such matters stand ready to trot out half a dozen fundamental or structural causes why these outcomes had to happen roughly at the time and in the manner that they did. In other words, before the fact, nobody seemed to predict them. After the fact, people said, oh, of course, they had to happen. <laughs> Indeed, and this is, this is uh, I'm quoting, <coughs> quoting them here, given the overwhelming, this is kind of good, given the overwhelming array of causal forces often invoked, it is difficult for some contemporary observers to resist the inference that the original historical players were a tad dense, not to appreciate where, where events were heading. And creeping determinism emerges as a key obstacle to the time-honored objective of historians to see the world as it appeared to the decision makers of the day, not as it appears now with the benefits and curses of hindsight. So we need what they're saying we need to put ourselves as historians, or as those of us who are interested in history, put ourselves into the shoes of the, the decision makers of the day um, and try to see things from their perspective. Now, by the way, this hindsight bias that Tetlock and Parker are referring to, this hindsight bias is something we see in all areas of human existence. 
Psychologists have long since determined that people have an amply documented tendency to exaggerate in retrospect the likelihood of an observed outcome. That is to say, people tend to see the future as more contingent than the past. I knew it all along, becomes the refrain. <laughs> Even when the outcome looked doubtful or was wholly anticipated beforehand. I think we do this, if we think about it, we do this our, in our daily lives frequently. Just want to quote from one other uh, interesting publication, namely the 9-11 Commission Report, if you can imagine. And it is actually an interesting document. Um, very well written, among other things, especially for a you know, group project like this. Um, the authors of that 9-11 Commission Report experienced this hindsight bias problem firsthand, and they summed up the problem, it seems to me, clearly and powerfully. So let me quote from the report. This is in the early pages. <clears throat> in, com uh, in composing this narrative, we have tried to remember that we write with the benefit and handicap of hindsight. Hindsight can sometimes see the past clearly with 2020 vision. But the path of what happened is so brightly lit that it places everything else more deeply into shadow. I like that phrase. As time passes, more documents become available and the bare facts of what happened become still clearer. Yet the picture of how those things happened becomes harder to reimagine as that past world with its preoccupations and uncertainty recedes and the remaining memories of what it become uh, are colored by what happened and what was written about it later. It's really quite a remarkable passage. So then the question becomes for us, what's the answer to this kind of deterministic thinking, to this hindsight bias? One an antidote is to ask what if? to think about what else might have happened. This is often called by historians uh, counterfactual analysis. Counterfactual analysis, which is a rather ugly phrase, but I'll use it, ugly word. What this, what this is about is bringing to the fore plausible but unrealized alternatives to what actually occurred um, and thereby can convey the differing dimensions of past situations and the presence of contingency. I've written elsewhere, I've written in some places about this mode of analysis, I've laid, even tried to lay down some ground rules for, for conducting it, um, and will say here only that those in our profession who frown on this kind of analysis, and many people do, are wholly unpersuasive. Even Richard Evans, the great historian at the University of Cambridge, a Germanist, yeah, said, and I don't agree with him on this, I would call this an, an uncharacteristic lapse of judgment on his part, he wrote, in an effort to understand, counterfactuals aren't any real use at all. On the contrary, I would submit, Thinking about alternatives is an indispensable part of the historian's craft. We can judge the forces that won only by comparing them with those that were defeated. The investigation of unrealized alternatives, that is to say, provides crucial, crucial insight into, into explaining why things turned out the way they did. So it's not just a parlor game. It's not just about saying, well, what if Napoleon had had nuclear weapons at Waterloo? Uh, that kind of what-if thinking is, 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 is not what I'm talking about. Moreover, all historians, whenever they make causal judgments, all historians are engaging in speculation, are contemplating alternative developments, even when these alternatives are not stated explicitly. Which means, ladies and gentlemen, that to vow to say nothing counterfactual, can mean vowing to say nothing at all. So, let me give you an example. With respect to the long and bloody war in Vietnam, which has been the focus of much of my own research, when, which of course lasted some three decades, 
uh, and for which I guess I've studied now almost as long. That's sort of a depressing thought. Um, but careful counterfactual thought experiments can help us better grasp just how vital was the contribu contribution of individual leaders. So, for example, there can be no doubt, it seems to me, that Ho Chi Minh's role in driving the Vietnamese, Vietnamese Revolution was immense from an early point. While on the French side, if we imagine the conflict without Georges Bideau, key French policymaker really from the beginning of the French War to the end, uh, we have a very different um, outcome. The central role of Pierre Mendes France in bringing that French war to a close in 1954 is likewise very large. On the American side, there's a reason why Vietnam is sometimes called Lyndon Johnson's War. Uh, my last book, which Sandra mentioned, Embers of War, looked more at the long-term causes of American <coughs> intervention, going back to World War II and to the French War that followed, franco vietnam War that followed. Um, it also argued for the importance of perceived Cold War imperatives that drove successive American administrations deeper into the Vietnamese morass. It argued for the importance of World War II and the end of European empires as contributing to the Indochina struggle. But there's no doubt, it seems to me, that Lyndon Johnson's imprint mattered enormously in the end in terms of creating a large-scale American war. He was, Johnson, from an early point of his, in his presidency, a skeptic about what could be accomplished in Vietnam, skeptical that the war could be won in any meaningful, lasting sense, skeptical even that it was necessary to try to win it. And yet, this same LBJ was always a hawk on the conflict. There's not a, there's not a contradiction between those two assertions. From day one to the end, from the time that he took the presidency in Dallas in November of 63 to the time he left um, the White House in early 69, I would submit that he was a hawk on the war. If his aides intimidated him by their academic pedigrees and their accomplishments, he in turn, Johnson in turn, intimidated them with his powerful physical presence and his frequent resort to bullying tactics. Though quite capable of asking probing questions in high-level meetings, LBJ had little patience with those who sought to give probing answers to those questions. His demand for loyalty extended to his inner circle of, his, of advisors, which, when combined with his towering personality, had a chilling effect on anyone who tried to build support for a contrary policy view. Now true, for those of you who know your Vietnam decision-making, Under Secretary of State George Ball did put forth such a perspective, one that in hindsight looks very prescient indeed. Um, But Ball's influence was greatly diminished by the fact that he was a kind of designated in-house dove. He had been assigned this particular role. Moreover, Johnson took the plunge in 64-65 because for him, retreat, in quotes, from Vietnam was impossible. It was, as he himself might put it, the equivalent of tucking tail and running. Johnson's tendency to personalize all issues pertaining to the war, which was so evident in 66, 67, 68, was actually there from the beginning, from his initial vow in late 1963 that he would not be the president who lost Vietnam. He always saw attacks on the policy as attacks on himself, saw American credibility and his own personal credibility as essentially synonymous. And he thereby diminished his ability, it seems to me, to render objective judgment and failed to see that the international and domestic context, this is sort of the conclusion of my, my, my dissertation back in grad school, which became my first book, the international and domestic context in late 1964, early 65, well, I think I'm supposed to stay behind here, uh, 
gave him options. That context, in other words, was fluid. Um, he had freedom of maneuver, especially after the landslide victory against Barry Goldwater in the 1964 election. Now, in both of these areas, or in several of the things that I've described, it seems to me that Johnson differed quite markedly from his predecessor, John F. Kennedy. That is to say, Kennedy <coughs> used his advisory system differently, especially after the calamitous Bay of Pigs uh, invasion in the spring of 1961. Kennedy was much more open to hearing different points of view among his subordinates. Moreover, JFK seldom, if ever, personalized foreign policy issues. He viewed them, it seems to me, with uncommon detachment. Some critics might say with too much detachment. Now, partly for these reasons, I maintain, and I think I may even have said this before, right here at this place, <laughs> in this building, not this room, um, on the mother of all what-ifs, the mother of all counterfactuals. I have said here, and I'll say again, that a surviving Kennedy comes back from Dallas alive, Oswald misses. I think that a surviving Kennedy most likely would have avoided a large-scale escalation of the war of the type that his successor ordered. We can't know for sure, but again, Counterfactual analysis can help us here, is my point, because it can, it can isolate the importance of an individual. And in fact, the Kennedy counterfactual is especially, especially conducive to this kind of analysis, and we can talk about this. Um, allow me, before I finish, before we turn to some discussion, I hope, to talk about uh, a matter that has been a particular research focus of mine uh, recently namely the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962, which brought the world, as I think we all know in this room, and many of you I think can remember the, the moment, brought us as close as we've ever come to catastrophic nuclear war. I've been going through the tapes and transcripts from the deliberations of the so-called XCOM, which is short for Executive Committee of the National Security Council, and have revised my own thinking in certain respects that I think bear on the topic at hand. And by the way, uh, I mentioned at the outset, joining the ranks of the president, presidential historians, I'm writing a full-scale biography of John F. Kennedy. So that's the reason why I'm, uh, why I'm undertaking this research. By the way, totally blew it on, the, on this people. As I said to Emily a while ago, I could have been playing for us here, uh, snippets from these tapes that we could have listened to as a group. We could have followed along uh, right over here uh, with the transcript moving down as we listen. Don't know what I was thinking. So well, we won't have that. You'll just hear me talk about it for a few minutes. But I mention it here because if you're interested, various sites, you can YouTube, you can also go to the Miller Center, which has a presidential recordings project, terrific project. Uh, and you can listen to not just JFK and the missile crisis, but lots of other important policy episodes, domestic, foreign, um, for three presidents, basically. There's some, there's, you can go back and get some uh, limited tapes for Eisenhower. Uh, you can even hear uh, FDR on the tape. And, and, and there, but, but the heart of this is JFK, Johnson, and Nixon. Strangely enough, people stop taping after Nixon. <laughs> uh, so uh, you, can, you can listen to, to some of the things that I'm going to describe. But again, I've been listening to the Missile Crisis tapes, and I want to suggest to, to, to begin with that there's a paradox here. And I'll write about this, needless to say, in my book. Um, on the one hand, there can be <laughs> no doubt that the United States under Eisenhower and Kennedy must claim a significant share of the blame for the onset of the crisis in the first place. 
<coughs> Kennedy admitted, admitted as much when he said during the crisis that Cuba was, quote, a fixation of the United States and not a serious military threat, unquote, and that NATO allies, quote, <coughs> Sorry, I'm not sure why I'm coughing. NATO allies think that we are slightly demented on the subject, as JFK. <laughs> By the autumn of 1962, this fixation had already led to the disastrous Bay of Pig invasion, Bay, Bay of Pigs invasion that I mentioned, and to Operation Mongoose, which was a covert, pro covert program aimed at undermining and overthrowing the Cuban government of Fidel Castro. Ironically, it had also contributed this American fixation, had contributed to Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev's move to deploy missiles on the island, hoping thereby to discourage further US or US-backed military action against Castro. So that's on the one hand. The US, in other words, is responsible, including Kennedy and his brother, the Attorney General Robert Kennedy, are responsible for, for creating the crisis in the first place. But on the other hand, listening closely to the XCOM tapes and rereading the transcripts and other materials has further convinced me of President Kennedy's crucial role in guiding his advisors and the world away from cataclysmic nuclear conflict. What comes through clearly in these tapes that we should be playing is JFK's understated but consistent management of the internal deliberations and his calm and self-possessed demeanor even in the face of severe questioning from senior military and civilian aides. From day one to the end, Kennedy allows people to have their say whether or not he agrees with them. And he never resorts to the harsh put-down. Rarely, Rarely does, does Kennedy uh, raise his voice in these meetings, even when he's obviously perturbed or irritated, and he nudges the discussion forward when it threatens to bog down. And by the way, I could add parenthetically here that historian Sheldon Stern, who has done great work on this, and who is not, I would say, any kind of Kennedy hagiographer, Stern has rightly noted that the paper records alone do not give us a full picture of these attributes that I've just described. I'm going to quote uh, Stern here. He says, so much that cannot be captured, even in the most accurate transcript or narrative, is there on the tapes for the listener with a discerning ear. The nuances of Kennedy's voice and temperament, his impatience, his Cold War blinders and convictions, his apprehension and anxiety, his doubts, his political instincts, his self-control, his persistence, his caution, his skepticism about the gap between, between military plans and performance, his ironic sense of humor, and above all, his conviction that war was impossible, an impossible choice in the nuclear era. That's Sheldon Stern. In substantive terms, there can be no doubt that the XCOM discussions helped JFK make up his mind and not as his senior subordinates wanted. By the way, that includes his brother, Robert Kennedy. We hear him, that is to say uh, JFK, on the tapes consistently disavowing doctrinaire judgments and confrontational recommendations and his unshakable determination to find an answer short of nuclear confrontation. Most impressively, it seems to me, he reveals himself to be willing to go against the cumulative wisdom of the XCOM and boy, were they a distinguished group of individuals. They could have intimidated most people, it seems to me. But he was willing to go against them in favor of a negotiated solution that virtually all of these people opposed. Already on October 18th, the third day of the crisis, JFK wonders aloud why Khrushchev has put the missiles in Cuba. And he speculates that they must be part of a bargaining gambit and that to get them out, he might have to give the Kremlin leader, quote, some out, unquote, some way to back down without losing face. One means, Kennedy muses, would be to say, if you, pull out, if you pull them out, we'll take ours out of Turkey. The Americans had uh, missiles in Turkey. That remark goes unanswered by the advisors. Later, this is now toward the end of the crisis on October 27th, 
which is the, it's really the second to the last day, uh, when Khrushchev proposes just such a trade, Cuba for Turkey, Kennedy lets his top lieutenants, again Bobby Kennedy, Robert McNamara, Dean Rusk, McGeorge Bundy, he lets them rail against the notion for a while, whereupon he says calmly, let's not kid ourselves. Most people think that if you're allowed an even trade, you ought to take advantage of it. Unquote. He goes on to say that if the United States goes to war by, counting, by mounting airstrikes and then invading Cuba, and if the Soviets then respond by grabbing Berlin, quote, everybody's going to say, well, this Khrushchev offer was a pretty good proposition. In other words, the one that we, take, that we had turned down. The advisors warned that such an agreement would destroy NATO, weaken America's standing in the world, and have other unforeseen and negative consequences. Only Under Secretary of State George Ball offers support for the President's position. Kennedy holds his ground, instructing his brother, the Attorney General, to inform <coughs> the Soviet ambassador that the administration will take the deal, provided it is kept secret. Khrushchev agrees. And the crisis ends. I think, folks, that we're left with the unmistakable conclusion that at a critical moment in modern world history, one leader, one leader made an enormous difference to the fate of humankind with help from his Soviet counterpart, to be sure, with a good dose of luck, to be sure, but nevertheless, he mattered. Now, again, to come back to what I said, this same leader had helped to bring on the crisis to begin with, and I will be writing about that. It bears noting as well that Kennedy continued, even after the missile crisis, to try to thwart the Cuban Revolution, to get rid of Castro, policies that I, in, in, in my judgment, look counterproductive, counterproductive and futile and short-sighted. Still, I come back to this point. During those fateful 13 days in October 1962, a year before his assassination, John F. Kennedy was at his best, and for that we can all be grateful. A cold warrior in public, he distrusted the military, I think actually going back to his own World War II days, which is another part that I will explore in my book. He distrusted the military, was dubious about the political utility of, utility of military action, and repelled by the prospect of nuclear war. And he had the courage and the will to act accordingly. At a critical moment, he showed, in other words, a capacity for empathetic understanding. This, by the way, I think is evident in his personality from an early age. You see this, maybe because he was sick a lot when he was a kid. But he had that empathy I think from an early age, it's one of his most appealing qualities in my judgment. Which means he had an ability to put himself into the position of Nikita Khrushchev, to try to see things from Khrushchev's perspective, and I think it was critical. I think he, maybe this is putting it a little strongly, but let me, as I draw it to a close here, let me try this out. Um, about the importance of empathy. For Kennedy, and maybe for us, it is because we realize that life presents challenges to even the most fortunate among us. That we are all flawed and vulnerable. That life is precious and must be treated with respect. It is for those reasons that we are able to reach out empathetically, to acknowledge our connections with our fellow human beings, which means, in short, that to empathize is to civilize. Um, I've gone on long enough. Let's, let me conclude by going back to the Marx quote that I gave you at the beginning. I didn't think I'd be quoting Karl Marx at the beginning and at the end, but here we are. <laughs> I think that the great German thinker was correct. Human beings make their own history, but not as they please. The historian's task, and I know there are at least a few of us here in the room, and maybe it's a task for all of us who are interested in history and try to learn from history. The historian's task is to take account of this reality, 
to balance out the elements of human agency on the one hand with impersonal forces on the other, and to write history that weaves together convincingly all the causative factors and, and takes into account their interaction. For after all, whereas impersonal forces may make events in human affairs possible, individuals make those events happen. Thank you. Delighted, if we have time, Sandra, I don't know if we do, but I'm delighted to take a question or two on, on the specifics, or more. Even more. Even more. Uh, Fred, recognizing the American presidency, and generally uh, described as our three greatest presidents, Lincoln, Washington, and FDR, mm -hmm. all dealing with crisis, yeah. and putting aside for the moment the uh, reference to Kennedy and the Mm -hmm. Cuban crisis. Can you tell us of any president that uh, made history during the non crisis period? The question was about a president who made history in a non crisis period. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being saved. <laughs> Say mayor. <laughs> Hulk. Elaborate, please. Uh, he was the president of the United States when we had the Mexican American War. And uh, from out of that, we regained all of this land from the, uh, on the western side of the United States, which is now the western part of the United States. Uh, now, I don't know who he defeated, but it seemed like. He was the one who was willing to go to war for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's. I think the Polk example works. I would put forth. Uh, one can think of several, but one, one important, very important development, that arguably, well, it's arguably a crisis, but well, we could debate that. But I was going to say that the great society legislation of the 1960s, it does emerge out of a certain domestic crisis. But many of the particular elements in that legislation had earlier roots. I think we're, we're coming to, to a, uh, a point of discussion. And so Lyndon Johnson, who I have been very critical of, including here today and in my work, deserves, it seems to me, credit for that. That's at least my own position with respect to the Great Society um, the programs. And also, so does um, his predecessor. John F. Kennedy, it seems to me, doesn't always get enough credit uh, for his own efforts to introduce uh, discussion of what ultimately became uh, that legislation. But there are other examples we could think of. David. Um, thank you very much for a really stimulating presentation, Fred. I want to begin with a very personal observation mm -hmm. that relates to your interest in presidential politics which is, if your cough is a symptom of pneumonia, you should let us know now. <laughs> All right. Um, I may wait till tomorrow. My team will maybe I'll disclose it tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so yeah, let me begin. I uh, want to revisit two, two of the points in your talk. Um, uh, the, the idea of hindsight illusion, uh, mm -hmm. what uh, Isaiah Berlin called the retrodictive tendency of the yeah. historian, yeah. as opposed to predictive, retrodictive, yeah. predictive past. Yeah. And I guess what I'm curious to explore with you is whether, in fact, it is possible to resist that hindsight illusion. Yeah. In fact, it isn't uh, ingrained into the epistemological practice, the DNA of the historian, to yeah. do precisely that. What yeah. we do is uh, move from provenance to conclusion, to fulfillment, yeah. Yeah. right? And it's built into that trend, the movement is yeah. a kind of teleological, yeah. forward-moving, linear entity. As tellers of narrative, we want to have a beginning, middle, and end to our story. Yeah. So there's something ingrained in the very act of historical reconstruction which almost mandates that. Now, um, the literary scholar Michael Andre Bernstein says that the way we resist that impulse to sort of back shadow, as he calls it, to tell the story through the lens of the present, is by recalling 
through what he calls side shadowing all the contingencies that are neglected in the past. And that, it seems to me, is our saving grace, is to remember all of those vectors uh, of, of historical movement that are occluded from our vision uh, as we sort of tell that very linear narrative story. Yeah. So I, I, I'm vexed by this problem too, yeah. but I want to just play it out with you yeah. and give some further observations. And just one more, one more point yeah. that I make. Um, Sorry, toss me that pen. Just hey. in case, David, if, in case this becomes, yeah, go please. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, you know, the use of the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, which it seems to me is a really sui generis. Um, I'll say a word about it, but I guess, just to put it simply, you know, what you're attempting to do by calling our attention to the role of individuals, and mm -hmm. what your excellent op-ed piece in the New York Times, which everybody should read from, I think, August 29th, uh, that calls for renewed study of political elites. What it really is is a corrective. That's what we do as historians. We're engaged in this kind of constant pendulous swing between poles. We are between the pole of impersonal forces and human agency and contingency. And I guess it's, you know, at the end you gestured towards this, but yeah. one wouldn't want to say that we should just focus on the actions of the political no. elites. No. It's very much about you know, you know, finding that pendulum in the center between the two. Um, and it's ironic, of course, that Marx is the proof text, given that there's no one who's contributed more to yeah. our understanding of historical change as a function of you know, impersonal um, yeah. forces that then Karl Marx. Yeah. So I, I think it's important for self, your self-positioning to really highlight this. Yeah. impulse as a corrective to a perceived excess emerging out of the new social history of the 60s. Yeah. Um, we can talk about the continental crisis. Uh, no, those are great observations. Uh, and I hope we can also talk, uh, talk later in the day about this. This is really interesting. Um, I think you're right that it is built into our DNA to um, that, that, or, yes, and that we can't, because it's built into our DNA, we can't entirely uh, bypass this and probably shouldn't try and needn't try. Maybe what we can, maybe the most that we can t try to do as historians is, is to, to, to see things as much as we can from the perspective of the actors we are studying. Um, and that, to give, to give, an, a, to give an example, um, is what was so mind-blowing for me when I first started studying Lyndon Johnson and the war. Because I remember in my first graduate seminar saying, of course the war had to happen. We might say now that it was a mistake, but if you think about this, there was the Cold War consensus that Lyndon Johnson had to operate within. There was the domino theory that everybody believed in. There was the threat of the, the Chinese uh, taking over for the Far East and, and the Soviets making gains. Uh, there was the domestic political price to be paid and so on. It was overdetermined. It was only when I went back and actually studied what was being said in 1963 and 64 and 65 that I realized, that as, as I said earlier, that in fact, um, Lyndon Johnson had maneuverability on the war, understood not only in hindsight, but at the time. So we can't, as David has pointed out, we can't entirely avoid this as historians, but I think we can be aware of it and to the best of our ability <coughs> um, take account of it by going back and seeing what was actually said at the time. There's by a, a quick side note on this. One of the things we also struggle with, I think you'll agree, David, is the, that <coughs> to contextualize can often mean to excuse. So that if we go back in time and try to see things from the perspective of, again, the people we're studying, we can very easily say, that regardless of what happens, well, in the context of this time, um, this, is, um, this is perfectly understandable, and we have to be sympathetic to this. This is often done, by the way, with respect to the founders and slavery. Um, 
once again, if you can go back in the historical record and you can actually see evidence that even at the time people were saying this is folly, even at the time they're saying we can't win in Vietnam, even at the time they're saying we don't need to try to win in Vietnam, and even at the time the president himself is saying these things privately, then you've got something. And I think that's the case, by the way, not only with Johnson, but I think it's true of Kennedy and Nixon as well, that they had these private doubts. So that's sort of a beginning of an answer to your, to your first point, Davis. David. Um, yes, I think you're right about the pendulum, that it's really about this being, a, uh, as David put it, a, a kind of corrective and that what we want to try to do, and what I need to try to do as I write this book about JFK, and maybe what we all need to do uh, when we're writing history, uh, it's about finding that center. It's about acknowledging that structure matters. Uh, that this individual decision makers, whatever country it might be, uh, whatever setting it might be, because this could also apply to local government, by the way, state government, uh, uh, non-government situations. You are conditioned by, you're restrained by the, the, the conditions in which, you, uh, in which you operate. And I like that notion, David, of a pendulum. Um, and you were also on to say something about the missile crisis as being sui generis, and I hope we can come back to that. Yes? suggestions to Maury's question and then one question for you. Yeah. Um, without taking from the next uh, speaker, Jefferson's acquisition of Louisiana without crisis, he took advantage of a crisis maybe in France, mm -hmm. certainly changed the nation. And the other one would be Teddy Roosevelt, who I think changed the whole nature of the presidency and America as being a, a modern state as opposed to where it was. And then my question, uh, Bill Clinton is often quoted as using the term strong but wrong. People like to see strength but, uh, in, in leaders, but even though they're, mm -hmm. what, what, what they're advocating is wrong, what would you say about that? Uh, uh, I think that's, uh, I would certainly second uh, that notion. Uh, I have argued in a, in a book that I co-authored with a, with a fellow named Campbell Craig, which was called um, America's Cold War, that the perceived need to project strength especially in domestic political terms, and to always, in, a, in electoral terms in the Cold War, always wanting to be to the right of your opponent, whether in a primary struggle or in a general election, and that that uh, had a certain impact um, not only on the outcome of the election, but also ultimately on foreign policy, that was of a, of a um, problematic nature, shall we say. That's something we argued in that book and that I believe in. I would say also that one of the things that I admire in uh, President Obama is that I think he endorses that notion. He has, it seems to me, a sense, uh, in my judgment, a correct sense uh, of the limits of military power. And even, no matter how great the United States might be in relative terms on the world stage, uh, it's, a, it's a blunt instrument. Uh, it will not accomplish in all instances what you expect that it will do, and that therefore this, that, you know, this strong but wrong, if that's the formulation, uh, is one that I suspect he too would endorse. There are reasons to be critical of President Obama's foreign policy, no question. But I think on that point, for me, he gets more right than wrong. Yes? About nine days ago, Douglas Brinkley was in town. I really appreciated his uh, strong, um, constructive effort to tell from the beginning of presidential history, whereas five years ago or so, Michael Beschloss was here, and I considered him truthfully more of an entertainer, a, a performer. And uh, yet, one of the things um, Douglas Brinke didn't treat was the Obama presidency. Mm -hmm. Obama's chief solicitor to the Supreme Court was asked a one-word evaluation of Obama during the time of his presidency, and he said, heroic. 
And I, I know Sandra Myers has a, a feeling that Obama's special. I shared that. But you did a little what if. Mm -hmm. What if McCain? Mm. What if Romney? Um, by the way, I like your t-shirt. <laughs> if you're not seeing it, no, this is important. Keep calm and read on, is what it says. <laughs> Uh, that's, I just, you know, we, we're not, um, we're not reading enough as a society. Um, well, I can't speculate uh, on, I mean, it, perhaps if we, if we, if we drill down and we talked about what if McCain or Romney in a particular policy instance, I guess I would just, I would just say this to you, that uh, in foreign policy, which is the subject that I know best, um, there is less of a break between administrations, if you look at the historical record, than what either the election campaign would suggest or what we might think from a kind of superficial knowledge of, of, of the developments. Meaning that even when there's a, a break between parties, so it's not just the president of one party giving uh, way to a president of the same party taking over, but when there's a, drip, a, a shift from one party to another, there is more continuity, it seems to me, than break. If that were to hold with McCain and Romney, and I suspect in many respects it would, then uh, the foreign policies of the United States would not have been, in many respects, as different as one might think. I think all three men, that is to say Obama, McCain, and Romney, accept large parts of what we might call the, the, the consensus on foreign policy after the Cold War, which is for the need for the, 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 need for the United States to remain, uh, to have primacy in world affairs, to be able to project its military power globally, um, to be very much engaged with, with um, European, with NATO allies and other allies around the world. Um, but again, on particular policy decisions, no doubt it could be different. And we might talk about a different Iraq policy or Syria policy, Afghanistan policy, uh, North Korea policy under one of those two other presidents. See, that's a foreign policy assessment. Yep. What I was looking for, hoping for, is that you would remember, perhaps, I was hoping for it from Douglas Brinkley. Hmm. Uh, he, he, he perhaps wasn't ready to assess. He didn't give it any treatment at all. We forget what it was like eight years ago. Yeah. Well, the other thing I will say to you here, which you will consider to be a cop-out, but I'll say it anyway, which is that we historians, the reason maybe Douglas didn't refer to this is that it's so recent. We like to have a certain distance between now, between the, 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 the events we're studying and, and the present moment. Uh, so that may be. Um, and I, I would be... I'll just say this, that on domestic policy is issues, if that's where you were going, no question. It matters to me, and I think to probably anybody, regardless of your partisan affiliation. That's why we're so divided. It matters enormously to me if we have a Democrat in the White House or a Republican in the White House. I think it's less the case with some important exceptions on particular policy issues in foreign policy. But no question. Uh, I think it matters a, a lot in domestic policy. Uh, it's why I think the next, whatever it is we have, 55 days, has me on pins and, pins and needles. Because I think this matters. The outcome matters a great deal. Yes? You can take about two more okay. questions. Okay. Right. You, you agreed with David uh, with the uh, uh, attractiveness of the pendulum metaphor. Yeah. And uh, the reason, as I understood it, uh, was because you see a, that there's a center, that historical discussions focus around the center. Could you say a little bit about what you think that center actually is? Well, it, yeah, I, I don't think I, I need, either one of us necessarily meant that you, you well, I suppose it depends on what you mean by, by center. I think what, what we were, or what I was suggesting, I'll speak for myself, is that that there is a center in terms of giving due weight to human agency in history 
and again to these larger, often rather subterranean forces and their role. So that um, even on a subject like Vietnam, where today I have emphasized for all of you the importance that Johnson in particular played, we have to acknowledge, and I do in my written work, the important role that the, the end of empire, the, dis, the, 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 the collapse of these European empires, the role that it played, for example, the rise of the United States to this uh, great power status, really important. Um, economic developments within and, and political developments within Southeast Asia. Uh, lots of these larger forces contribute to, uh, to the Vietnam case. So that's, uh, that's what I think we're referring to with center. I think you're probably talking about something else when you're saying where do you think that center is. Well, actually, since, since you mentioned Marx, it's, I think, fair for me to mention Nietzsche, who, who would come at this with several different understandings of the purpose of mm. history. Mm. And that's the sense in which I was asking about mm. center. You know, what, what, what is it that we hope to uncover mm -hmm. by studying history? Yeah. Well, I, th you know, I think, for me, history is in part about the aesthetic fulfillment of seeing how people have acted in the past, looking at both the heroism and the folly uh, of what those who came before us uh, did, uh, and that there's something about reconstructing the past, for lack of a better phrase, that is both intellectually really fulfilling and absolutely fascinating. And so I'm grateful that I get a chance to do this. But that's not the only reason why I do what I do. I also think that we can generalize from history that history and understanding of our past is crucial for us uh, to understand where we are currently and where we might be going. History, it seems to me, helps us to see patterns. It helps us to understand that not everything is new under the sun. Um, and even though I think most of us who are historians, especially academic historians, are leery of prediction, I don't think we believe in the predictive power of the past. Um, nevertheless, I think we can, we can generalize enough from past experience to have a good sense of why, if we take this particular course, this is quite likely to happen uh, versus that course. Um, beginning of an answer, but there's much more to be said. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe to ride the crest of this wave, that David, I yeah. think, started with this question. Uh. Now, um, th this idea of uh, retrospective determinism, mm -hmm. uh, to some extent, is hostile to the notion of human freedom. I think that's one of the things that Nietzsche is concerned about yeah. when he's wondering about the use and abuse of history. I, I think it's one of the things that Collingwood tries to uncover, okay. and, it, and it leads to a notion that I, that, that, that it, at least in one tradition gets called the, the difference between positivist history and idealist history. Idealist history tries to get into the thought and the mindset <laughs> of the people who are involved in making decisions, and I, and I, I heard that when you were quoting Stern, and I mm -hmm. think he was the one that, that said the, the discussions in XCOM, or XCOM, mm -hmm. you need to hear it because you need to grasp the sensitivity of these people. I, I, I applaud that because I, I think that to the degree that we become students of necessity, students of structural change, and, and ignore the importance of the individual, I think to that degree we become, we become narrow and, and, and perhaps paralyzed and incapable of dealing freely with, uh, with, with circumstances that, that come across the table to us. So I, yeah. I applaud that. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I wouldn't, I think that was really well put. I, I don't have very much to, to add to what you just said. I do think, I think yes, I think there's a, um, a diminishment, maybe that's not the best word, that occurs in that sort of a situation. And I think that Sheldon Stern's quote, you know, in a certain way, as you say, points to, uh, to the need to avoid uh, that kind of thing. And I think that, I think that we can. And I don't think, by the way, 
that we can only do it for those few short years when we have this marvelous resource called the tapes. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 think, I think we can do it if we're, if we're, if we're good and, and conscientious and careful historians. We can do it for, for, for um, many, many different time periods, many, many different settings, many, many different historical questions. I will simply say that for those of us who do have the opportunity to work with the tapes, uh, it can, and it, you can really hear this in a way that you wouldn't see just in a transcript. JFK and civil rights. When he and Robert and his brother uh, begin to, to grapple with this area, with this issue, and they're a little slow to come to it, I think we would have to acknowledge. But come to it, they do. It's fascinating to be able to, to determine this in a way that you wouldn't from other kinds of, uh, of, of, of records. So um, that was very well said. I, if, if we're at the end of our time, I want to thank you all very much. Thank you, Fred, for shaking us up, shaking our minds up. Now, um, it's 3 o'clock. We are scheduled to um, have a short break. And uh, who would like to not take a break? <coughs> Nobody. Oh. Well, then take a 10-minute break, OK? <laughs> then we'll come back. And don't forget that at the end of the day, there will be a reception. And you'll have more time to talk to the uh, speakers. <laughs> <laughs>